knives, machetes, saws, and shears, multi-tools, shovels, swords, axes, spears, hatchets, and tomahawks. If it cuts, snips, slices, or chops, Midway USA has it. Find great gift ideas in our huge selection of pocket knives and other everyday carry folding knives. Make a statement or create a family legacy with one of our top-of-the-line hunting knives. We've got a great selection of manual and electric sharpeners, too. For just about everything for the outdoors, check out MidwayUSA.com. Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. Well, today's podcast is exploring one of those aspects of fly fishing that is just the kind of thing I like to cover on Casting Across, and I think particularly suits itself to this podcast format. About 15 minutes of talking about one, maybe bit of minutia, or one very niche aspect of fly fishing. And today we're talking about fly fishing using dry flies downstream. So a common convention says that you're going to fish a dry fly upstream. Now, there's a few reasons for this. One, you are able to uh, get behind your quarry so that you are not disturbing the water that is in its cone of vision. So if you know anything about how trout see, uh, they can see above themselves, which actually uh, is a wider cone of vision because of the way water refracts. So they can see more above the water uh, than they can see underneath the water. And that actually becomes exponentially greater the deeper they are in the water. Um, but then they also see in front of themselves and, uh, of course, to the sides as well because of where their eyes are positioned on their head. Uh, and so consequently, if you are back and to the side of a fish, you put yourself at the best situation for not spooking them by m- the mo- motion of you in the water or of your rod casting or even of that presentation of that line leader and fly. And so that's one of the reasons why common convention is that you cast from downstream and to the side. Uh, additionally, there's some angling benefits to this for your presentation. So you're able to lay your fly down, uh, first, and then that fly is able to, uh, drift over the fish and your leader is going to be angled away from the, uh, the fish. But also, uh, when you make your mends, you can make mends in, in a way that you are really only manipulating the line because the line is much closer to you. Mending is such an integral part of having a good and proper drift when fishing any five, but specifically dry flies, because you want that thing to look like it is dead and it's not moving unless you don't, which we'll get to later. And so, of course, as that line is drifting back to you, you are either picking it up or making mends using your rod tip. There's a bunch of things you can do, but that's something that is easier when that uh, fly is upstream and coming back towards you. And of course, everything else is coming back towards you as well. And then another very uh, common sense reason why you want to do most of your dry fly fishing upstream is that when you set the hook, you are pulling back towards the closed portion of a fish's mouth, the corner of its mouth, as opposed to out of its mouth. And uh, that's why you, when you're making a cast from downstream to upstream, you are putting yourself in a better situation to hook that fish. However, even though this is what you should probably be doing the vast majority of the time, we've all been in situations where there is a fish rising downstream and we've not only been tempted to cast to it, but we've cast to it and we've probably caught that fish. And that might not be the best way to do it, It may have been better to get out of the water, take a wide berth, a circuitous route around that fish and its feeding lane, and approach from the bottom and make that cast, and that would have been the better, more textbook way to do it. But I think we probably have all caught fish using dry flies and casting and presenting downstream. But it's not just out of laziness. It's just it's not only out of uh, uh, being pragmatic and doing what's quickest. 
There's also times and plenty of situations where a downstream presentation is the only way you can get to a fish. You might say, no, there's always multiple ways to get to fish. Well, maybe. But how about this? The only reasonable way to get to a fish. And that even has an asterisk on it because it is not the most ideal way to make a dry fly presentation. However, there are times when you need to be able to do it. And so I think that there might be times where we need to explore how the best ways to do this may be. Now, anecdotally, the, one of the best fish I've ever caught, to be honest with you, it, it was a big fish. I mean, it was a 20-inch brown trout, uh, but even though I've caught bigger fish, I've caught bigger fish in the, that stream, uh, this was a fish that I had been pursuing for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, it was under a bridge, and the currents were such under this bridge, and I don't know what was under there. I was only under that bridge one time, and I knew there were some big rocks under there. Uh, but it was a really low bridge. Like I had to almost be bent over so that my torso was was uh, parallel with the water when I was underneath this bridge. Um, but the currents were funky, such that even though I could make casts from the downstream side underneath this low clearance concrete bridge, I could not get a good drift. Uh, the the bridge was maybe uh, a lane and a half uh, uh, wide, and so to get it to the far side, the far upstream side of that bridge from a downstream presentation, that was virtually impossible. I mean, I feel like I'm a decent caster, but I could not make that happen. So between the currents being weird and because it was very hard to get that presentation to be on that upstream side... I approached from the upstream side, and this was a fish that I had been watching rise. It was a big fish. I knew that before I even landed the thing uh, or hooked into the thing because I could see its nose coming up and taking the midges and the terrestrials that were falling from underneath this bridge. I mean, there were spiders everywhere on this bridge, and so every once in a while, there'd be a more violent rise when uh, one of these spiders or another bug that got stuck in its web would fall, but more often than not, it was just rising to midges, and this fish would rise morning, noon, and night, and so I really had my, my choice of when I wanted to fish for it, and so I tried that. I thought maybe this thing will be dumber in the morning, or maybe this thing will let its guard down at nighttime. I ended up catching it right at uh, dusk, uh, but I'm not sure if that really played into it or not, but I had to approach from the upstairs stream side. And what I did, well, there's a few things. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of different aspects and how this is something I've integrated in, in other fishing situations. And I'll give another uh, anecdote here in a moment. But the first thing was stripping a good amount of line out of your reel. Why is this? Because you do not want that dead drift to be compromised because you are having to fiddle with your rod tip to get more line out of your rod guides so that it can continue its path downstream. Now, uh, real quick, I'm going to make an aside. What I'm talking about now is fishing under obstructions. And, and what, in my opinion, this is the primary reason why you should be making a downstream dry fly presentation. Uh, anything else I would say is probably lazy, pragmatic, whatever. Uh, but out of necessity, fishing under obstructions is probably the primary reason why you want to make a downstream dry fly presentation. So that's why you're going to have to feed line to your fly. But you, you want to do a few things at the same time, because obviously you can't have all this line out of your rod tip, because then if the fish strikes, you're not going to be able to retrieve enough line and get tension on that fish, particularly in a way where you make that good hook set as that fish is striking from downstream towards you so that you are going to make that fly go up into its mouth. Um, of course, best case scenario, that fish turns away and you're able to make a normal hook set, but you need to optimize your hook set and, uh, and it's just assume that fish is going to be going up and down. And so you're going to want to make that hook set straight up. So you can't do that though, if you have a big puddle of line in between you and that fish. So I like to have a good amount of line outside the rod tip, but not so much that if I have to make a dr dramatic straight up hook set, I can't make contact with that fish's mouth. So you have a little bit of line, but outside of your rod tip, and then you have a good puddle of line off of your reel and uh, between your your reel and your hand. And then, of course, you have your hand and your stripping guide. And so as that fly is drifting downstream, you want to make sure that there's enough line between your rod tip and your leader so that if you move your rod tip to help feed line out, you're not going to be altering the uh, trajectory and the dead drift of your dry fly. 
Hopefully that makes sense. So again, you have line between your reel and your stripping guide, and then you have enough line between your rod tip and your leader so that if you have to move your rod tip, maybe a little bit of a wiggle, maybe a gentle raise to get line to feed up through it, that it's not going to alter the way that your fly is drifting. Now, one way you can do this is actually throwing line with your left hand, which for if your right hand caster is your line hand, into that stripping guide and kind of help push it up. If your guides are clean, if your line is slick, then this will actually work. It's effectively the same thing that you're doing when you are hauling. Uh, you're, you're pushing that line up into up into those guides to help it get up and out the rod tip. So that's one thing. The second thing is actually kind of moving uh, backwards is to use a long, supple leader. Because again, here, the name of the game is to allow that fly to drift in an unencumbered manner, even though there's a chance that your line is going to be moving at a slower rate than that fly is, depending on the kind of drift that you are fishing or the kind of current that you're fishing in. So I like to use a longer leader than usual. So if I've been casting upstream with a 10 foot leader, then I'll probably jump up to a 13 foot leader. If I'm being very, very uh, finesse and delicate with a 12 and 13 foot leader, I might go to a 16 foot dry fly leader, taper down to something even a little bit more narrow. So if I've been fishing 5x, I'll drop down to 6. If I've been fishing four, I'll drop down to five because I want that fly to be the primary moving agent in that current. I don't want my leader and I definitely don't want my line or my rod tip influencing the way that that fly is moving. So again, we kind of have this picture of the bridges downstream and you can use some other, you know, obstruction, but you have made a cast. And then what you're starting to do is as that fly drifts downstream, you are in whatever way it works best for your rod, your rod length, your rod action, and where you're fishing, you are manipulating that line to go up through that stripping guide and out through the rod tip so that enough line is being fed into the current so that your fly drifts naturally. And so back to my story, uh, this is precisely what I did. I had to make cast after cast. I would make a cast of course, closest to me. So if I am on uh, one side of the stream um, and I would cast to the side that's closest to me and see how that fly would drift. And then and this is the tricky thing when you're fishing downstream is how do you retrieve that fly? If you don't have success on that first cast, how do you retrieve that fly so that it doesn't spook the fish? Well, you allow it the whole thing to drift past that fish, especially if you're targeting a particular fish, which again, if you're doing this kind of thing, a less than optimal presentation, you're hopefully targeting a particular fish or a very likely lie for a fish. You allow that whole line to straighten out, and then you allow it to swing towards the bank, again, assuming the fish isn't right on the bank, and then slowly retrieve it without popping that dry fly out of the water or make, pulling up into a back cast. So pulling the fly up, so then I worked my way from closest to me on that bank further and further into the, uh, the, the middle of the stream where that fish was. And in doing so, I was able to detect how those currents were working. And eventually, that little tiny Griffith snap drifted over to where that fish was and it rose. And then, of course, the hook set is another important thing. You need to wait an extra beat. As you probably know, for most dry fly takes, an instantaneous hook set may very well pull that fly out of that fish's mouth, especially if it's not a really big, splashy, turning, aggressive rise. If it's a gentle sip, um, which again, fish that are that are feeding in places like this have a high degree of, uh, of confidence and safety, so they're taking their time. This was a big, mature fish that knew what it was doing, so it was a nice, gentle sip. I had to wait what felt like an eternity for that nose to completely disappear back under the water. And then while I pulled the slack with my line hand, raised that rod hand straight up and hope that that line and leader didn't bump into the overhanging bridge and cause some sort of weird lever action, pulling that fly out of the fish's mouth. It didn't. I struck pay dirt before that happened. And then I was able to play that fish quickly getting it out from underneath that obstruction. Because generally speaking, whether it's a bridge or a tunnel of rhododendron or a blowdown or some sort of obstruction like a dam or something like that, there's usually not just stuff over the water. There's usually stuff under the water too. And they may even be connected. So getting that fish out of that spot is very, very important. So that's just kind of one example. So a few other aspects of downstream fishing. 
that are, are, are worth exploring. One has to do with the fly pattern. I mentioned a Griffith snap earlier. Now, of course, there may be times when fish are, are feeding on a very specific pattern. There's a hatch on, or you've patterned those fish in, you've caught a bunch of fish using one particular fly, and it maybe it's it's like a, um, a light Cahill. It's like a very like traditional uh, dry fly pattern. Okay, if that's the case, then you probably want to lead with that. But if you are fishing in a, a manner like this, you're fishing downstream, there are some benefits to fishing a fly that has an extra level of buoyancy. And here's a few reasons why. One is what I already addressed. If you are fishing downstream and you do not connect with that fish to retrieve that fly and not compromise the next presentation and that fish being spooked, you're going to want that thing to drift all the way down and you're probably going to pull it along the surface, but what is even more ideal would be slightly under the water to create less of a disturbance so you have another shot or set of shots at that fish. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing that is worth thinking about when making that downstream presentation is something that you can do depending on the type of insect it is, and that is skate the fly and to get it right in front of that fish. Now, if you are fishing terrestrials, if you're fishing caddis, and even if you're fishing some sort of a tractor pattern, this is a great way to trigger strikes. Again, with a fish that has some idea or conception of safety because it's underneath something, they may be a little bit more reckless in what they're going to strike. They're going to take advantage of this. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm not a fish psychiatrist, but I do know that fish that feel secure are going to be more likely to strike more flies and different kinds of flies. This is simply experience and common sense. And so having a Griffith's gnat a very well palmered fly, even though it's a nymph, you cover that thing with enough floatant and you can position it even after your cast and a couple of uh, you know feet of drift, you can use that rod tip to slide it over a little bit, to skate it over. You're fishing a caddis fly, the same thing. You're fishing a hopper. I mean, you can strip that thing, pull it upstream, but in doing so, you position it so that it's going to be right in front of that fish. Now, this is kind of my second uh, a story or example is doing this to very wary Spring Creek trout that would never in a million years take a poorly presented dry fly, but fishing downstream into some heavy weeds, cattails, all sorts of uh, overhanging foliage with hoppers in the late summer, making those casts and then stripping that fly so that it gets really close to those weeds. Well, what's happening? I'm imitating precisely what a hopper would do if it fell into the water. And in a way that you can't necessarily do if you're making an upstream cast, I, you can pull that fly back upstream if you're making a downstream cast, and that fly is fighting not only against the current, creating a big wake, but you're pulling it back towards the bank, which is precisely what an insect would do if it was able to maneuver itself in the water and it wanted to get out of the water. And so I had a couple of wonderful days over the course of a week fishing a spring creek where I was stripping hoppers upstream and back towards the bank. So standing in the water, you know, 30 feet, 25 feet upstream of where either likely lies or, or rises that I've seen are making that cast and giving that attempt at that first, the uh, strike when that, that hopper lands and there's that plop, will that fish come up and take it, giving it a twitch. And then if nothing happens, stripping it and then letting it go still and you're stripping it upstream, it's making a nice little V wake and those aggressive fish, even moderately sized 12 and 14 inch trout were going after it because it was doing something that is unnatural for most dry flies, but very natural for terrestrials, particularly things like hoppers. So uh, once again, same thing, having a little bit of line that's between your reel and your stripping guide, having a little bit of extra line out your rod tip, using a little bit longer and more supple of a leader. But all of these pieces together allow you to fish in this unconventional way that oftentimes work. So uh, there's a lot more that could be said about uh, this, this small and maybe unappreciated or underappreciated aspect of, uh, of dry fly fishing, but it's definitely worth being familiar with and not being afraid of doing. Again, like I said, if there are fish rising downstream and you have the ability 
to get out of the water, go around and make that upstream presentation. That is your best bet. But there are times and there are situations and there are circumstances where whether it's just that fish that happened right away and you just can't control it and you need to make that cast or because there are obstructions that would make an upstream presentation prohibitive that you can, should, and be prepared to uh, make these downstream presentations with dry flies in order to get to the fish that you want to get to. Questions, comments, accusations, let me know, Matthew at castingacross.com. Actually, you, you know, you pick up a, an old angling tome, a, a book that has a lot of information about how to do a lot of things well, and this kind of stuff is in there. This is not new. This is not novel. This is not something I've come up with. It's just in my experience, especially fishing spring creeks and fishing urban situations where you have a lot of weird uh, obstructions and uh, cover in your, in your creeks and in your rivers, uh, this is a technique that not only comes in handy, but sometimes it's the only way to get to certain fish. This week on castingacross.com, another video. It's called uh, Video Trail Running X Fly Fishing. Kids put that X in there to say like uh, together, cross, featuring, you know, like a collaboration on a hip hop song. Uh, but it is me talking about and showing stuff I use to combine trail running and fly fishing. So I've written about this quite a bit. I've podcasted about it. So I figured because this is something I really enjoy, uh, I want to feature it any way I can. So I put it on YouTube. So if you want to see me and a really, really fetching uh, fishing shirt, then you can go check that out over at YouTube or going through casting across and clicking on the link there. So trail running X fly fishing. And then uh, Wednesday's article is called Open to Fishing Once Again. And uh, this is something I'm probably going to talk about in the podcast in the coming weeks. But uh, Shenandoah National Park closed down for only about a month and a week or so uh, because of low water conditions. But it's back. And here's the thing. This one was shorter than last year. Does that mean there's not some sort of trend in the climate? Does that mean that there's not some sort of... No. But it's interesting to note that uh, it wasn't as bad. And it was actually in the middle of August this this ban got lifted. So, you know, it's not doom and gloom. It's just good management, specifically in an area that gets a ridiculous amount of pressure. So it is not uh, cause for doom and gloom and thinking that the sky is falling. Those brook trout have experienced much worse, and they're probably better off in many ways today than they have in the last 100 and 150 years. So put you can check out that article, Open to Fishing, once again. And in it, there's uh, a lot of information that uh, you can uh, click on, which will uh, get you into the National Park Service news feed, which is uh, an, an awesome thing to read some really informa interesting information um, that I, I keep uh, my finger on. There's stuff that has to do with fly fishing, but then there's other cool things too that it isn't going to necessarily make mainstream media, which isn't the worst thing in the world, but is definitely interesting for the outdoors person to check out. This week's recommendation on the podcast is a very simple thing. Sometimes I recommend very, very expensive stuff. Today, I am not recommending something expensive. I am recommending something that right now is $5.99 at Cabela's and or Bass Pro Shop. It is the 7-in-1 multi-tool. Now, I know that you can get a really, really nice Leatherman. You can get some really, really nice multi-tools that do all sorts of stuff and that'll be bulletproof. But this little 7-in-1 multi-tool, less than $6, it comes in purple, red, teal, silver, green, and orange. Uh, is a great little tool to have on hand. And here's why. I think all four of my boys have one. They have one in a different color each. They all have so many knives. But this little one, when I say, hey, uh, does anybody have a screwdriver or does anybody have a knife or does anybody have a pair of pliers? This little tool has popped out of their little hands more often than not and helped me in the house, in the woods, on the water. Uh, it, it's great. It's tiny. It folds up. It's the kind of thing you could buy one and drop it in your sling pack, put it in your fly fishing vest, put one in your backpack, put one in, you know, and even if this isn't your primary knife, it weighs next to nothing and uh, it's less than three inches long and uh, it's got spring loaded plier jaws. Again, it's not bulletproof. It's not going to last forever, but for $6, I've benefited from it enough that it justified the, you know, four times six as I bought these for my kids over the years. So I'll put a link to the Cabela's seven in one multi-tool. And if the exact link that I have in front of me pops up, you're going to see it in purple, which, you know, your buddies probably won't steal your purple multi-tool. So it's a win-win. 
Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe to your favorite podcast app and then rate the podcast in iTunes and Spotify. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. Thank you.